Whangarei. The worst hit areas appear to be Poverty Bay, Gisborne and North Hawke's Bay. Five residents from Tenerife from Gisborne have been evacuated, while in Waidor, the main bridge has collapsed, cutting the town in two. Many people spent the night camped on their house roofs to escape the floodwaters, and in New Plymouth, at least 50 houses lost their roofs. Power supplies to many of the storm-afflicted areas was yet to be restored. The Minister of Civil Defence, Michael Bassett, is expected to reach Gisborne about now to inspect the damage. He's accompanied by the Director of Civil Defence, Ed Latter, and the Minister of Agriculture, Colin Moyle. There's no decision yet on government assistance for the storm-damaged areas. The Army is preparing to mount a major rescue operation in the wake of the storms and flooding. Personnel and vehicles are now on standby at locations throughout the North Island. A spokesman says about 300 men and 60 vehicles are ready to move once the word comes from civil defence. Meanwhile, a rescue mission is underway for the stricken yacht Starlight Express, battered by huge seas and gales while competing in the two-handed Trans-Tasman race. The yacht cancelled an emergency call for help last night, but still needs assistance. The rescue boat hopes to be able to tow Starlight Express to the Bay of Islands. Some other yachts in the race have been badly knocked about by the high seas, and most have hove to until the weather clears. Both Air New Zealand and ANSET are operating normal services this morning, although conditions at Auckland Airport are marginal. Air New Zealand says there are slight delays on some services, but there doesn't appear to be a big backlog of passengers from yesterday's cancelled flights. The railway say ferry services are running normally, but the Wellington to Gisborne Express will stop at Napier. There's no rail link to Gisborne and buses can't get through either because now the road is closed. The weather offer says the strong winds and heavy rain lashing much of the North Island are likely to continue for most of the day. The remnants of Cyclone Bola to the north of New Zealand and the ridge of high pressure over the South Island are behind the stormy conditions. Forecasters say the situation will ease only slightly over the next 24 hours. Tonight, violent storm batters much of the North Island. Four people believed dead and thousands evacuated. Good evening. Network News for Tuesday the 8th of March. Gale force winds and torrential rain have wreaked havoc in many parts of the North Island. Four people are feared dead, hundreds have been forced from their homes. In some places the roofs of houses were ripped off, in others roads have been closed by floods and slips and in many areas people were without electricity for up to 24 hours. The savage aftermath of Cyclone Bola claimed an elderly farmer's life near Whangarei when he drowned while trying to move stock to higher ground. And on the east coast, three other people are missing, presumed drowned. Their car was swept away by a swollen river at Tolaga Bay. The worst hit areas are the east coast, North Taranaki and Northland. On the coast, Wairoa has been split in two by the collapse of the town bridge. Floods have also swept away Wairoa's water mains and power and telephone lines. The mayor has appealed to residents to conserve water and food. A state of emergency was also declared in Gisborne as nearby rivers burst their banks, flooding low-lying areas. Hundreds of people were evacuated from their homes in several small settlements inland from Gisborne. In North Taranaki, gale force winds blew the roofs off several houses. Between New Plymouth and Oakura, about 300 homes were damaged by the winds, which are continuing tonight. And there were high winds and flooding in Northland. Much of the area around Whangarei was without electricity for many hours, and some places won't have power restored until tomorrow. The town of Dargaville has a critical water shortage after floods swept away its main pipelines. Civil Defence Minister Michael Bassett flew to the East Coast today to look at the damage there and afterwards said the Cabinet will meet next Monday to consider financial aid for areas affected by the storm. Tonight, Wairoa on the East Coast is still cut off from the rest of the country. The town's been deluged by rain for two days and today its bridge carrying State Highway 2 across the local river was washed away. The people here weathering the storm overnight woke up this morning to find most of the Wairoa River Bridge gone. With it went the water supply and telephone lines. The town itself is effectively cut in half. As I was coming up towards it, I must have been about 15, 20 metres away from the actual opening of it, and I saw the bridge just, just go, just virtually be swept away. It must have looked pretty weird. It did, actually. I, I stopped my car straight away, I just couldn't believe it. It's launching as the whole bridge obviously ripped away from the, uh, from the buttresses either side. It must have made a tremendous noise. Yes, it was. It was rather 
you know, rather, how do you say, um, nerve-wracking, really. This afternoon, the swollen river was still pounding at the torn remains of the bridge. Emergency services can only communicate on two-way radio. They've ordered everyone to stay out of the way inside. Ford have locked one bowser and it is only going to be used for essential services. Wairoa's immediate problems are petrol, food and water supplies. Food is being ferried across a railway bridge, but it's a treacherous journey. The bridge is being pounded by logs and the river is rising. Households will only get an hour's fresh water supply daily until the emergency is over. But another serious problem is the town's isolation. Roads north and south are cut off. Wairoa normally gets daily food supplies from other main centres. Outlying farmlands report flooding, but few homes have been evacuated, and authorities say it's too early to assess stock losses. Local police and civil defence staff say there's nothing they can do but wait. Wait until the rain and wind abate, but more importantly, until the river goes down. But late this afternoon, it was still rising, leaving authorities holding their breath, watching other bridges and other roads. The Gisborne region has had floods before. Today it was flooded again on a frightening scale. Thousands of hectares of farmland were swamped after torrential rain for 40 hours. The Waipa River rose 11 metres, millions of tonnes of water surging seaward. The tragedy hit farmers severely. Kiwi fruit, maize, tomatoes, grapes, apple and sweet corn disappeared beneath the deluge. For the locals, the rain brought heartache. The coming crisis was evident last night. Emergency services evacuated 500 residents from the tiny settlement of Tikaraka. With danger to life averted, residents could reflect on the damage to property. This would be the worst we've seen it. It's a bit like that. Can you describe some of the situations on your farm? Well, there's no, no sign of any of the vineyard at all. That's completely gone. Uh, our two 5,000 gallon tanks are completely underwater. Your home's on high ground, is it, Rob? The home's on high ground, there's no problem there. But, uh, we've got an implement shed down there that uh, would probably be half full of water now. City dwellers suffer too. On the Gisborne seafront, dramatic evidence of the strength of the storm. Trees having been uprooted by rivers, washed downstream, only to be flung back on land by an angry sea. And not just trees either. Animals suffered as always. Sheep and deer huddled in the water, keeping close for warmth. On high ground, their plight looked terrible indeed. Less than a third of Gisborne's grapes had been picked. The rest were likely to be harmed by the wet. Just on 1,040 people were evacuated from their homes during the crisis. Late today, a state of emergency was still in force. With bad weather on the cards tonight, civil defence was continuing to work frantically for the flood-affected people of Gisborne to try to minimise further suffering. In New Plymouth and northern Taranaki, the storm has caused some of the worst damage ever seen in the region. The state of civil defence emergency declared in the area could remain in force for several days. Residents say the last 24 hours have been the most terrifying of their lives. Winds gusting up to 120 kilometres an hour have damaged more than 400 buildings and ripped the roofs from about 60 of them. It was in the dark early this morning that the damage began. Chimneys were one of the first to go, then windows began smashing and roofs lifting. In the light of day, emergency crews began repairing essential services, often at the risk of their own lives. But it wasn't long before residents were being ordered out of their homes when the damage became extreme. We're leaving the house, we're told to stay out and, and, and keep out of the house. Who told you to stay out? Uh, the fire brigade and the insurance assessor, so don't go back into the house. How do you feel about having to leave your house? Bloody terrible, to be honest, bloody terrible. At Oakura, just down the coast from New Plymouth, the damage was the worst. Even near new homes lost their roofs, and residents were fearful for their lives. We had no sleep, we came down the flat here to try and sleep, but we couldn't sleep for the tin rattling, and about two o'clock the roof 
off and completely off. But uh, daylight this morning, and this is what I saw. You ever seen anything like it before? Never, never. 60 years, I've never seen anything like it. The road between New Plymouth and Oakura was closed before midday today, and only the most essential reason could get you through. My wife and family are there by themselves. Okay, well at the moment it's, it's closed down. The whole of State yeah. Highway 45 is closed down. Yeah. And now there are emergency services out at Oakura. Yeah. Um, they'll be well taken care of. If you've got people in town that you can just stay with for a few hours until it calms down a bit, okay sir? This normally busy main street of New Plymouth is today virtually deserted. Since early this morning, people have been told to stay home, and if their home's intact, to stay inside. Debris like this, which has blown off the roof of the nearby Shell BP Todd building, lies everywhere, and can become a lethal weapon in the high winds. Civil defence officials announced late today that no repairs would be attempted on damaged properties until the winds drop, because of the risk to the lives of the workmen. However, although the winds could ease in about 24 hours, the weather office says the wind was likely to be followed by heavy rain. Northland too has been battered by high winds and rain. Houses were wrecked, roads closed, and there have been widespread power cuts. Cyclone Bowler blew through the back of the Spangaday home in the dark of night. Debris smashed down the walls, letting the wind finish its path of destruction inside. The storm wrecked the house that had been the home for Nolene Tibbetts and Gary Wright for just one year. Only eight days ago, they'd redecorated with new carpet and lino. It's estimated their work, undone by the cyclone in a few frightening hours, will take up to four months to repair. The storm left widespread destruction across Northland. It toppled trees, blocking roads and cutting off power. Coastal areas found least refuge from the wind, where visitors as well as locals are counting the cost. Boats along the coastline slip their moorings in pounding seas. And fishermen found their livelihoods washed up on the shoreline. Their salvage job is already underway. Cyclone Bowler is drifting south, but Northland's problems aren't over yet. Forecasters warn more gale force winds and rain are likely tomorrow. A state of civil emergency was declared late this afternoon in the Thames area. Tonight, Thames is reported to be completely cut off, with floodwaters blocking roads at both ends of the town. High tide is expected at midnight, and civil defence officials fear serious flooding. At Tepuru, 42 people have been evacuated because of rising floodwaters. And a new report from the East Cape area tonight says the people of Ruatoria are settling down for a second cold, dark night. The power has been off at Ruatoria since 9 o'clock last night, and there's little hope of it being restored tonight. A local resident, Kopua Ka, says morale in Ruatoria is high, with residents getting together to share food supplies and help one another out. Out at sea, the storm has continued to batter yachts competing in the Sydney to Auckland race. One of the worst affected boats, Starlight Express, has been towed to safety at Monganui in the far north. The two crewmen are said to be unharmed, but weary after fighting huge seas for 48 hours. As the storm intensified overnight, the National Civil Defence Headquarters in the Beehive swung into action for the first time in a year. The last time the bunker was fully manned was during the Bay of Plenty earthquake. One moment, please. Good morning, Doug Green speaking. Buried beneath the beehive, the headquarters monitored the situation overnight. Information is fed up to the Prime Minister, ten floors above. Essentially, the headquarters monitor the overall situation to advise the government. We're really showing that those uh, settlements have been isolated throughout the night, uh, and that uh, uh, there are quite likely to be people who are, are, uh, are stuck either in their houses or, or fairly close to their houses uh, even though there has been some evacuation being done uh, in most of those uh, small settlements. In the East Cape region uh, it has been described as being uh, as bad as and possibly worse than the uh, floods in 1948 so it's, a, it's a, at least a 40-year flood.
In the next few days, government officials who met at this building this morning will move in backup machinery to help anyone affected by the storms. The Bay of Plenty earthquake taught government departments this sort of backup must start quickly. Late this afternoon, the Minister of Civil Defence, Michael Bassett, and the Minister of Agriculture, Colin Moyle, landed in a gale force Wellington wind from assessing the East Coast trouble spots themselves. I would anticipate that we'll be in a position to have a proposal to go to Cabinet on Monday, uh, particularly relating to the uh, crop loss, which is the most serious. Mr Moyle is here with us, and of course he was the one who got an opportunity by helicopter to see just how serious that is. When you talk about a proposal, you're talking about uh, financial assistance? Yes, yes. Is it going to be substantial, do you think? Oh, I don't know. Dr Bassett said today's flying conditions were among the worst he's travelled in. The weather office says the worst of the storm has now passed, but the problems are not over. The depression caused by the remnants of Cyclone Bola still contains gale force winds and heavy rain. Weather forecasters expect bad weather for at least another couple of days. Computer graphics show the development of the storm from Sunday evening. The red patches represent the high cloud typical of cyclones, and as the depression came south it almost pivots on the East Cape, where the worst damage was caused. The inverted comma shape is typical of a spent cyclone, and although the hurricane winds have gone, the effect on New Zealand remains severe. Of course it does bring a lot of very warm, moist air, and of course any coastal regions that are in the way of this, um, it causes a lot of uh, rain, especially as this warm, moist air gets pushed up over the, uh, the mountain ranges. Heavy rain from the front swelled rivers still low from summer, but the anti-cyclone in the South Tasman is expected to move eastwards, and push the depression away from the North Island. And forecasters predict conditions should improve slowly over the next few days. Traditionally, it is the cyclone season, but New Zealand hasn't been hit by one since Cyclone Bernie in 1982. The weather office says it's unlikely we'll get another one this year, but not to relax as the Wahine sank on April the 10th. And just to hand, civil defence authorities in Gisborne have ordered the evacuation of the township of Patutahi, just outside the city. All residents have been told to leave their homes and move to evacuation centres. People are also being evacuated from the Wairanga Ahika district. So far, more than a thousand people have been moved from their homes in the Gisborne district. Officials say that number could double by later tonight. Coming out, the North Island counts the cost, and in the latest development, more than 60 people have been evacuated from their homes near Twyford in Hawke's Bay, as concern mounts over the stability of the Naroa River. The giant river has been deluged with heavy flows of water running off the hills. While there's been some relief in the last hour, workmen are still keeping a watching vigil in case the river breaches its banks. Kerry Ann Evans has the latest details. The call to reinforce the stop banks came this afternoon when water from the back hills hit the Hiratonga Plains. The catchment board's been repairing the banks over the last week, but fear grew when officials realised the new banks might not be strong enough to stem the flow. The danger period was around 7 o'clock this evening, but that critical stage passed without problem. The state of emergency will remain in force until tomorrow morning if the banks bear up, averting any threats of damage to the region's lucrative export crops. Elfridge problems. On Taranaki, the main priority today has been to protect damaged houses from the expected rain. Pauline Hudson prepared this roundup of the worst hit districts. Cyclone Bowler's path of destruction is being worst felt here on the East Cape tonight where it's ripped through rural communities, wiping out entire farms and isolating thousands of residents. Damage right along the coast is estimated in excess of $20 million, including devastating stock losses. Bad weather is continuing to hamper rescue operations. Helicopters are dropping food and medical supplies where they can, but to some isolated areas, access is impossible. Most of the roads are still out, but the big job of clearing main routes has begun. Closer to Gisborne, more than 2,000 people have been evacuated. They're spending tonight in halls and homes around the city. None are allowed home yet. I don't want to try it again. I'm 77 years old. Tonight, food supplies became a major concern. 
several groups of three to 500 stranded people were located up the coast and Iroquois helicopters were racing against the dark to deliver food and medicine to them. Army personnel are helping out with major water supply problems in the city and health risks are mounting. Tonight, water levels on the raging Waipua River are continuing to drop, but it's still raining and there's more winds and rain forecast for tomorrow. The Civil Defence say conditions are still desperate and the state of emergency here is expected to remain for another two or three days. In nearby Wairoa, where the town's bridge is destroyed, cutting the community in half, food and medicine supplies are also tight. Only one helicopter has been servicing the area. It's ferrying emergency supplies. Civil defence officials are fighting big communication problems. All telecommunications are still out. Some of the 300 residents evacuated were allowed home today, but many others have to wait for floodwaters to clear. Meanwhile in Taranaki, residents raced against time tonight to cover their homes with tarpaulins. Savage winds ripped roofs off yesterday, and heavy rain tonight threatened more problems to six milkins, and there's a high risk of mastitis infection among cows with swollen udders. Civil defence workers this evening lifted the state of emergency in the Thames area, but devastation that forced out residents will keep many away for tonight at least. At Tapuru, near Thames, Cyclone Bola transformed the local stream into a raging torrent. 25 residents were evacuated. They salvaged whatever they could. Many spent hours helping firemen battle the floods. Though the danger's over in Tapuru, the problems aren't. It could be several days before some residents return home. Further south near Taupo, Cyclone Bowler's trail of devastation cuts through thousands of hectares of forest. Trees grown for construction timber are now only fit for wood pulp. The task of cleaning this mess up will be... Massive flooded viral, taking the whole bridge away. There's the span, that's... We saw it actually happened at 20 past 6 this morning. Just bring it around here a bit more, we're showing the lighthouse and everything. They've got it all uh, locked off over there in the bridge, just on this side, naturally. Uh, the alarm was actually started around about uh, midnight um, last night. The tide is a high tide, but it's around about uh, 11 o'clock this morning. So um, you can uh, see how high the river is racing down now. I suppose at this stage it's probably at its peak. But um, there's an idea of what it's like over there. When we're here at 20 past 6 this morning, just in this big gap just over here, uh, around about in the centre, there was um, a massive big build-up of timber, around about, uh, oh, I would say an acre. And um, the bridge slowly started to twist, and then uh, the, we the, broke the, one of the water mains, and that was spouting out, so they turned off the water. And then it, uh, the weight of the logs eventually lifted up the middle of it over there and, uh, and then on this side gave a massive big twist, lifted it up and it, it was a, 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 a real roaring, uh, twisting, sort of thunderous sound as uh, it sunk down into and, um, and uh, collapsed. Um, the, the, there was that much timber around that uh, all the uh, uh, wood and logs and everything just carried the whole bridge itself just downstream right away down right away around the corner until it was just sort of completely out of sight uh, around Spinner's Point we went round there and there was still a portion of it was uh, at that stage was uh, still sort of being carried by the logs it even carried some of the piles that just goes to show you the intensity of the amount of timber that there was there and at that stage, uh, underneath the uh, bridge, bridge here, there was about, uh, oh, about a metre uh, of gap underneath it. Probably a metre right along the whole bridge, even over the far side over here. But as you can see here, down here now, uh, you know, the water's, the water's, uh, you know, right up high. But it was, 
Just down here, this chair, Bruce, probably about another 15 metres further out. Wasn't particularly high at that time. But so, uh, you know, this is uh, Warhol's disaster of the day. Looking right around. Uh, sightseers having a look around and seeing what's going on here. A few shops are open. Not many. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's real disastrous. When you come right around here, um, and I'll show you, and I'll boom in, uh, there's the pipe of the water main, sort of, sort of poking up in the air there. Well, okay, uh, on that bridge there is not only the water main, but um, it's got uh, the, the uh, power lines, there's one lot of power lines, and also uh, the PNT, which is where the telephones over the far side. Now, there are power, there is power coming over to Wairo through the rig from those poles up there, you can see at the top there, and they come across the power lines, uh, you can just see the top of it, the top of that building over there. Now that's the only power that we've got that's feeding Wairo. So, uh, uh, at this stage, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, all not good for us. Just leave it at this and have another view from uh, the other side if I can. The view of the bridge is quite I won't show you particularly much. I'll just bring it in. Right, now I'll just uh, take a look at the side here. And then come across. I'll go across the other side of the bridge and have a look and show you the there. Raging through. It's starting to fill up a here, as you can see. The padding pool. And around over here, uh, they have got uh, they tend having uh, a sort of sand to sandbag, sand, sandbag stuff if it does get on a about uh, midnight tonight, so that is going to be uh, the biggest problem when uh, all the water from the top, uh, like Wake Up Run, etc., is coming down. Here on the grass here. I'll just bring it in from the far side there just to let you have another look at what it's looking like. That's one of the refrigerated trucks over the other side. They've got one of the fire engines over there with it uh, early in the peak. We've got Johnson over there, but I understand that there's a woman over there at this stage that's uh, expecting a baby any, uh, any minute, so uh, she might have to have it at that stage with uh, the doctor. This is down at the uh, camping ground, and here's our dear old roam shed, which used to row in. I'm all ready right the boats, uh, you know, all there. The height 
is quite a bit higher. That chair there, where I was uh, standing early in the afternoon, is now well underwater. It is now up to a matter of uh, about three feet from the river. The helicopter just flying over now, and I'll just go out there and uh, and uh, see what I can show you. Here's the helicopter on the top there, that's obviously uh, TV or something like that, monitoring uh, the river level. As a matter of fact, I'm quite sure it is uh, the TV uh, plane. But uh, the water is still racing down, but there's uh, a hell of a lot more, to, uh, more water to come down here because uh, uh, it's been raining up the stream uh, a lot more. And uh, tonight, uh, around about midnight, is going to be quite crucial. So I'll walk across the road now and see what's going on. The uh, bridge as it was, as you could see there before, when I was doing it early in the afternoon, there was uh, about a metre underneath this part. It's now right up to the river. Uh, it's still flowing very, very fast. But if you look around here a bit more, there's the lighthouse, which I uh, was taking a photo of before. And it's well under. Uh, this is the height that the water is up to the bridge at this stage and they've got a bit of sand banking coming on just over here at the top and you'll find that uh, that's just the beginning of the sand banking that will be done. Um, as I mentioned before, midnight tonight will be very, very crucial. There's nothing really wire or river uh, the following day. This is the second day up. We had uh, hell of a lot more rain last night, especially up country. And as you can see there, the uh, river has uh, risen uh, about another three, three feet. Um, I was just pointed out to you yesterday, uh, one of the uh, chairs that uh, was over there that we were sitting on. And uh, see just here how far you can uh, see it now. It's only just uh, taking the head above the uh, water. So um, it rose to about this height last night and uh, it's sort of stayed at this stage. They're still pretty scared because um, uh, the tide is going to be uh, at its full peak of height uh, around about 11 o'clock today. So um, there's still a terrific amount of water coming down from the way up uh, amongst the hills and uh, this is going to be possibly the biggest telling time because uh, the water at this stage is at its highest. Um, with the tide um, reasonably low. Uh, it's on its way in now, so um, it's just a matter of uh, waiting and seeing. As far as the engine, uh, just outside uh, the toilets down here, pumping out the hill of our water, they've been doing that uh, for um, all day yesterday too. But not with the engine, they just had some auxiliary pumps. There's all the sandbags. Uh, this is uh, from uh, down uh, the technical ground area, facing up, up towards the bridge. Uh, helicopter around here somewhere. I'll try and pick it up. It's uh Ah oh, there it is. I don't really know what we've got underneath there, but he's got something. Uh, he just lifted that up from over the other side. I believe that he's uh cutting some fire somewhere. Big stations uh, a bit underwater there. So there's water, water, and more water around. This is uh, from taking up from the top of the uh, hill. This is uh, a day where the whole sun's shining out now, and uh, we've got. Uh, all of everybody over here, as you can point out here, is waiting to uh, go back over to North Clyde. What they're going to do is they're going to shuttle us on a bus right around to the railway bridge at Aramati. And, uh, and then I understand that uh, Waitaki have got their uh, loco and uh, some uh, wagons, I understand, so we can all um, go in that right over to back to work and to see what's actually happening. But the, um, 
the helicopter now has just picked up Mike uh, Cox and uh, some of his cohorts and they've just taken them for be a survey right around the whole total area to see what's, uh, what's going on. Phase of the, of the uh, power board, he's uh, the chief engineer and he's uh, going away now to uh, try and connect up some more, some more power. Up here we have a uh, roadblock by the Ministry Works that has at this stage been a little bit of a uh, controversy um, on who can go through. According to the Ministry Works the road is completely closed but uh, then the police came along and they decided that uh, all the people that were on the bus um, can go right through. And so what's going to actually happen at this stage is down here there's uh, the Unimog and um, they're going to uh, ferry us right through uh, through this area, uh, yep. right around here. This is the uh, two raw cutting which has been uh, badly uh, slipped over and around here where the Weybridge is, it's, uh, it's quite bad. And it's all silted up and, and uh, the Ministry Works aren't particularly happy but uh, uh, by the sound of we're sort of overall. It's quite quite well down and it's going quite slow so it's, it's, it's back to normal. Actually, it's quite surprising how uh, low it uh, has got. This is everybody here just waiting around for the unit hall to take us right through. the train hadn't arrived so um, there was a lot of us got impatient and uh, we decided that we would uh, decide to walk along uh, the 
the railway track and across the line to um, uh, get onto the uh, plane itself. And here it comes now. The tractor services. There's, the flood's been right through here, all the way around. Down the street, everywhere, through these houses, right away up. Came right away up to uh, down. Still wet as anything, so you can imagine just sort of how uh, the depth of it is. Bad. It was right through, just through his workshop at one stage. The stuff there that he's cleaning out. This Wallace's. The, uh, the uh, fire hose has uh, uh, swung around and is standing in the river. What they're doing now is uh, trying to get uh, a light rope across and then from then uh, they'll uh, pull across the steel cable. But, um, at this stage it seems to be reasonably successful. We've actually got the rope across now. And uh, that's the next uh, task is to uh, pull something else over, you know, the steel wire hose across on the uh, cable. You see it's uh, it across here, so only about a third of the way across. And then uh, I'll close off now for a while and then uh, Maybe another display a little bit later. As you can see now, we've just about got the hose right across. Fireman from Gisborne. History, the, road, the uh, hose is right across. It's just a matter of uh, connecting up now to get water back over to... Uh, So the hose has sunk right down very, very low. There's a lot of water that being the hose, a lot of weight. And uh, we're expecting the cable over here. Uh, we don't think it'll stand, stand the weight.
This is Friday the 11th of March 1988. They've now uh, got the uh, fire hose over the river as you can see. They had to um, uh, have a dozer over the far side with um, a very heavy thick cable, a decent size, about three quarters of an inch. And uh, they tightened that up real tight because they had a lot of problems with the hose dragging in the river naturally with the uh, small cable that they had. And uh, so that's really strung up tight. I'll just move around here now to uh, the days on the other side here. Yeah, they've got the days here uh, with the winch on it to really bring it up tight to carry the weight of the water. So um, water now getting over to, uh, to North Drive. From North Drive over to uh, uh, Main Town. PNT are on the job there now. They've uh, uh, still connecting up the uh, um, telephone lines for the uh, main uh, North Pride uh, business centre. The private ones they're going to dispense with in the meantime. The helicopter are just being over the country and they're going to come from the other side. Well, most of them uh, uh, know what they're doing. One of them is the one they executive. a tricky job uh, landing in uh, on the pitch here with uh, a bit of stuff on the road. The gentleman in the front here, he's uh, obviously one of the um, uh, more powers, the bigger powers of P, uh, with whom she works. He you know, seems to know what he's doing.
and uh, the director from Portland Island uh, see the wire just sort of uh, poking out from it and that would be uh, the upstream pier uh, the next one out and it's uh, you can see the massive lean that it is so uh, it's uh, when the bridge went they just uh, tore that pier in half and uh, took the rest of it downstream you can see the cable coming from there down to the water it's, uh, it's sort of caught under something at a stage that's a big cable but they're going to uh, carry on pulling it right through and uh, put a bit of weight on it and um, pull it up from there I think my theory is that they should have pulled it back and uh, untangled for a start, but uh, they appear to pull it. Yes, there's a joke here. I, I, I don't think it is, but anyhow, uh, three guys in that boat there, they, uh, they come over the side, they pull my cable over, and uh, they seem to be joining it onto the rope that's on the top there, but the problem is, is that the, the main cable, one of the main ropes, is this guy has got caught underneath, uh, which I feel is uh, the other half of the pylon. Yeah, they're going to be uh, going the wrong way. Uh, Mr. Client House, uh, the big Pinataki on the electricity department, he's uh, surveying the situation. And, uh, he's just looking around now to see what's going on. Um, could probably agree with what's happening, but um, just a matter of waiting and seeing, I suppose, like every the rest of us. A little bit bored, he's probably going to go over and give us some more direction. Now, what they're actually doing is uh, they're, they're they're pulling this pipe through and um, what um, happens is the uh, post that they've got it rolling on uh, at times sort of gets on to an 
an angle to go to straighten them up and, uh, and uh, some of them have sort of been working their way out so that they've uh, yeah, I've got to stop every now and again and uh, readjust all the uh, posts. Uh, uh, Sunday the 13th, 1.35 in the afternoon. Yeah, long last, they've got a bit more progress and you can see uh, where they're pulling the uh, pipeline uh, out by the uh, entry on the far side. Tension the, tension the wires once it's across. They're uh, still using the guys here to uh, pull along with the... Uh, pulling it over a bit more now. Uh, in the morning. What's actually happening here is um, we've got some men held up in this cage uh, by um, Mr. Little's um, uh, big um, crane and they're just uh, tying down, um, well making sure that, that the, uh, there's no um, uh, problems with the main pipe up the top there and they're just putting a few uh, extra safety uh, ties on it. Ron Brown just walked past, uh, he's uh, one of the uh, men from the uh, local uh, constabulary um, uh, to do with the waterworks. Now what is exactly happening here is um, the um, P&T uh, the post uh, um, uh, communications department were just connecting up one of the uh, pipes that they um, can pull uh, the cord through.
that's what you call fairly high, lift it, being lifted up um, by the crane. Those two men have just finished fixing up the um, the uh, piping and they've just been uh, brought round to be lowered down the ground again. Now that pipe there is, um, as you can see, there's a bung on the end of it and um, it's uh, uh, in the process of being pressurised uh, by that uh, diesel um, motor um, pressure pump and uh, what they do is they um, um, blow uh, a small, very, very fine cable over um, by pressure. They put a little um, um, bomb on the end of it and um, just um, have compressed air and it just blows the uh, c cable which they're feeding through there now as you can see with they just pressurized it and uh, it was it's just feeding it right through this is um, the uh, gantry that was used before what's actually happening now is they're uh, slacking uh, off the cables the tie down cables and they're going to get ready to remove it as you can see there they're just um, and dying, uh, untying the uh, tie downs now. Just uh, <coughs> rewinching the um, Slack of the cables back up for um, for cutting away. All in all, I think there's nine or ten uh, cables hanging from the top of that gantry. Just keeping a little bit of tension on the cable um, to stop it from getting too slack when it's uh, wound around the drum. in there, uh, got a length of rope, he, what he's going to do is tie up all the uh, slack ones so that they don't sort of flop around. Now as you can see there, um, that's the uh, bomb that they uh, put in to, uh, to uh, seal up the end of the pipe. And they're going to do it to the second pipe now. As you can see they're just uh, putting that up in there. And you can see how they've got the uh, one of the wires, just a thin wire, uh, running down a little groove. And he's going to hammer that up there just to make it tight. And um, uh, that wire, that little wee thin wire is joined up by, um, and onto a uh, parachute, a miniature parachute. And as they blow the air in it, it blows a miniature, miniature parachute um, through the uh, piping. Uh, which is joined onto that cable and you can just see it um, about to sort of move away there now and that, that uh, blows the um, uh, cable which you can see just about due to move uh, right across and out the other end of, and so that they can uh, uh, latch onto uh, another rope and pull it back because the cable that they're going to pull through there um, on the uh, uh, first one was a, um, uh, a 200 millimeter and a 300 millimeter 
and on, in, in, on the, the second pipe there's going to be an 800 millimeter so um, and it's quite a strain and it's, it's quite a netty way that's been done this is the um, big rig which uh, is about to move out of uh, out of the road you can see all the track system is um, virtually a complete tank setup quite unique really powered by a big uh, GM diesel see the way all the uh, bogey wheels are oscillating there's the driving uh, wheel sprocket is the pro proper term now what's actually happening is they've uh, pressurized the uh, pipe and uh, here are the guys feeding the cable through which has been uh, virtually sucked through uh, by the um, with, with the pressure that's uh, going on there uh, on the end of the parachute a little bit of a, an accident there um, the, the men are lifting up uh, one of the um, uh, water inspection plates um, very very close to having a major catastrophe um, that uh, rig was uh, turning around and it uh, caught on uh, top of the inspection plates uh, where I think is one of the fire hydrants and uh, if it had moved around too much it would have uh, torn the uh, main uh, pipe hydrant uh, valves and uh, there would have been water everywhere but luckily it uh, didn't do any damage Suck Adams from um, Adams Engineering. Uh, that is the water pipe coming up, and he's uh, going to uh, weld up a fitting um, with bends on it to join up with the main water pipe that's been drawn over uh, during the weekend. Bert Phillips uh, helping him, um, they're cutting a gasket um, for the uh, main there. Communications men uh, tying down uh, the piping because it's uh, quite a big strain when they uh, uh, pull the big cable through and naturally it's going to be quite a big strain on that bend. See how they've um, got some supports for the uh, piping that's going to pull through. Well, it's not really piping; it's it's the cables that are going to pull through the uh, pipes. The main uh, water main is um, just about fully in place. They've got to sort of just tack it on now. As you can see, there is uh, Mr. Adams, uh, Huck Adams. He's um, just uh, welding one of the uh, bends up. Here is um, Alan Spark, he's the uh, gentleman in control of, that's, that's his boat that he's um, got attached to the barge and uh, he's doing a very very good job, he started at 5 o'clock this morning and by uh, uh, half past 9 he had done 17 runs across uh, the river and back so that's uh, quite a good feat, he can certainly handle it very very well as you can see there the, the barge is uh, tied onto the side of his boat and um, uh, it's very safe, it uh, doesn't um, uh, rock at all and uh, it can, what's actually happening is they're bringing up to uh, 40 um, passengers at a time across the river.
getting close to the bank uh, this side. Well, this side is, uh, as uh, Alan Spark said, uh, over to the mainland, which is uh, North Clyde, he considers. Just uh, coming up to um, a, um, a floating ramp, and uh, there's um, uh, two men each side, which uh, with with uh, ropes are thrown to them, and they just uh, pull the barge in closer to the ramp, and then you uh, step off into it and uh, back up onto a dry land. Some workers, uh, some sightseers, uh, and uh, some shoppers, and I suppose uh, some that have gone over and uh, stayed uh, the other side um, of the river f uh, for the evening and coming uh, back home. That's a ramp. Uh, that was uh, built by the late um, Mr. Uh, Robert Short, um, the ex-mayor of Wairau. That is the uh, unit um, owned by communications, um, telephone communications, that is actually uh, um, designed for winching uh, cables through uh, piping or ducts. And uh, that's exactly what's happening now. It is. Um, started to uh, winch the first lot of um, cables through uh, the lower duct and uh, there, there as you can see is the uh, cable moving as it's um, slowly winching the, um, the main uh, telephone cable through. The army arrived with all the badges. The army arrived about uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, and um, up top there is uh, on on the back of uh, one of the transporters is um, uh, badges, one on top of the other. Uh, I I think there's about uh, eight of them. There's some of the uh, army personnel that are ready to get into gear and... Um it's arrived. It's a success. The PNT cable has been pulled over very, very successfully. This is the first cable and they're uh, again they're on uh, uh, what they say is uh, uh, 500 and uh, the next one is going to be 800. So uh, it's going to be a, a tougher test than the present one. Back to the army again, they were just in the process of uh, lifting the, the barges off. That is one of the um, personnel that's uh, sitting outside, he's the one that's working um, the uh, crane uh, off um, one of their um, quite big uh, tow trucks, it's, uh, it's uh, very well rigged up. It's, uh, Virtually almost as spec as much as uh, Mike Little's um, massive uh, big uh, crane of his uh, that he's got.
off the first one comes and it's uh, just about to be lowered down onto the ground um, uh, to be moved down the road. on deck, uh, carting um, one of the uh, pontoons down. What they actually end up by doing is um, joining them uh, back to back. This you will see later of actually how it's, um, it uh, all sort of forms together. The um, one of them uh, SA unit. There's, there's the two pontoons there, which have been pinned together. Now they're just going to shoot that up and assemble another two pontoons. As you can see, uh, one or two of them don't mind getting into the uh, cold water, and I understand it wasn't very warm either. You can see where they're buttered together, and um, I'll show you um, how uh, they uh, put a rod down. There's one goes now on the other side, it's putting a rod down be, um, between um, the <coughs> pins. Uh, it's classed as a pin, really. And then just line up the uh, holes on the uh, pegs, uh, the eyelets there, and uh, just drop it down. And that um, ties both the uh, boats, uh, pontoons together, back to back. And that now is sort of classed as one unit. As they're assembled together, they um, move, just moved up the bank so that they can uh, bring down another two to join them up. This is uh, part of the decking, and um, you'll see how it fits on. There are slots on each pontoon, which uh, uh, part of this decking uh, fits in between. And you'll see that when it gets on that they'll push in some pins to um, uh, hold it in, in together and then make it stable. Yeah, there it is there. See the uh, locking pin? The second one goes on the other side. As you may say, to uh, form a, uh, a driveway. 
these are used uh, in the army mainly for transferring uh, vehicles uh, across rivers and lakes and uh, that sort of thing. Now you'll see they've brought another pontoon down by the side of it, uh, which they're actually going to join that together and um, put these this ramp uh, against. Uh, the other one and, and uh, pin it together, forming a um, uh, raceway, I suppose you would call it, or a platform. There's another two joined together. One of the army personnel standing in the, the water right up to his shoulders. He's not uh, feeling the cold of the stage, but um, he will start to shiver a little bit later. We're now down to the stage where they're assembling the ramps. decking and also uh, the uh, pontoons themselves are made of uh, light alloy, very, very strong, very, very strong alloy. On the back of the pontoons there are frames
16th of June, 1988. This is Alan Spack's uh, modified um, barge at this stage. What he did is he put a uh, roof on top of it. Oh, that was the original barge that uh, was owned by Anunui. He put this roof on top of it and uh, he's now charging 50 cents a crossing. It's all covered and everything and um, it's quite a good service. And it's now replacing the good old army barge, which has uh, just been dismantled. Um, in a very short time, they'll be coming around to uh, the bridge on the other side, and they've got Mike Little over there with um, his crane, and they're going to lift it off straight up and in, into uh, uh, the, the area, which is the flat on the side, the other side there, and so that they can um, dismantle it on the on the ground. I'll bring you another close-up of Alan's uh, large little ladder. It's a rubber ducky. The last we've seen of that also. Little on the, on the uh, end of the bridge there with his crane all set to uh, lift it up. Beautiful day today. Uh, absolutely ideal conditions for lifting uh, the barge and everything up. Earlier this week we've had uh, just about snow in, in, in Wairau. It's been uh, Abrukaturi and uh, Ohoka. Mori Rana's had a foot of it. So um, today seems to be quite a, a God blessing really. These boys are just coming up slowly to uh, move around to where the crane is.
decide against using those uh, type of strops and they've uh, reverted it back to um, some chain. Uh, it appears they're going to um, look at uh, up more to the centre of the, the pontoon rather than uh, on the outsides. On the back, in the background there is the uh, Ministry of Works drilling rig there doing uh, some uh, testing there on uh, the uh, pile depth uh, as, far as, as far down as they can go uh, onto um, the foundation on the bank there. What's happening here is they're uh, taking some of the surplus uh, gear off the top and they've uh, obviously got a truck parked around the other side uh, and they've backed up on the bridge so that they can just load it directly onto there. Those uh, are the ramps that were on each end that they're lifting up now, that they've dismantled. stuck at one end. Going to uh, reposition the uh, chains again, I think. conditions. What they're going to do is they're just going to dismantle the deck uh, too and then lift up uh, each of the uh, pontoons uh, one at a time. They're just part of decking which they've uh, removed there, which actually holds all the pontoons together. They've removed everything else off the top, all uh, most of the other accessories, so uh, it's quite obvious they're going to dismantle it uh, visually on the water and just lift uh, everything up uh, piece by piece. At one stage uh, they told us that they were going to move it, uh, put their rope around the whole lot and lift the whole lot up and uh, put that up on the uh, dry land and then uh, just move it from there. It appears that uh, it's just as quick as this one. There's been a bit of an act down there. He's got a hold of a rope and then what they've done is uh, let slack on it. He's got his head officially uh, dangling in the water and he doesn't know how the hell he can get back now. Somebody else is very aware of all of them, he's trying to pull them back up. He's not far away from the ducking. There he goes. Saved by 
by the uh, gun or the rope you might as well say they're actually um, parting the two pontoons that they've got uh, joined up back to back they'll be doing there is just lifting uh, each uh, pontoon up uh, one section at a time. they're going to do is uh, lift the pontoons up, they've already lifted one up, they're on the second one up, that's the other half.
Oh, Jesus, Carl. <laughs> I got a little jump, man. Yeah, but he's just in the ground now. Yeah. You won't, they won't do it. He's not even turning the wheels up. He, he can't. He can't. Yeah, it'll take Kevin all his time to pull that thing back. Yeah. I wonder if it's a drilling rig. No, I, that's no. Let's be a, uh, a shaft off the back of here. Yeah.
can hold tension on the cut on the line so that it holds the pipe out front a bit straighter because we're sort of going down on the front of the bridge.
Royal Bridge. This is a uh, series of photos that uh, was taken by Neil Phantom. And I've got them enlarged and I'm just uh, taking them off now just to see how they come up. This is the first stage of the bridge collapsing. stage. Fourth. Take note of all the uh, take note of all the timber at the uh, back there. That's the that that would cover a full acre. the odd side rail it's sort of hung up there and if you study very hard you can actually see um, quite a bit of the bridge floating down
Just now, just to all things clean, to clean the my barrel bridge building project. This here is the uh, in the pile, which has just been poured. Bridge pylons will be going along to uh, the bottom section here. Uh, that level up there, you can see it's quite a height uh, above the uh, prison road. In fact, it's been led to McConnell Down. That is that firm there. Uh, what they're doing is uh, they're putting a temporary bridge across here so they can use their crane and uh, be able to work with the side of it. Over here is a uh, subcontractor called their contract is to uh, put the uh, files there. As you can see there, there's uh, four files.
on the old piers on the bridge. Everybody's knocked off the smoker. They've got a uh, special uh, machine which uh, drives uh, this big crane which is actually on rails. And uh, they go to and fro with uh, with uh, big beams, these sort of beams. They'll come right back and bring that crane right back and it'll uh, pick up a couple of beams and then they'll transport it back out and then they'll uh, have the net back down on the, uh, on the other side. That there is a uh, frame already for the, uh, this is the first pole that's actually in the, in the river and the second, there'll be another one just goes further out of there. I understand there's going to be uh, three piles uh, in the, uh, the actually main part of the river. You'll see where this is all braced up on each side. With, um, pipes just to get, make sure that these uh, go down on the right angle. See there's a pipe there and they got it on four, four sides and uh, plus down here you can see where they are there now just to uh, keep the angle at the bottom there guys at least two days. And I, uh, I noticed in the paper there where one uh, engineer has been replaced with another one. And I, uh, I uh, take it for granted that uh, he might have been responsible for the uh, truck up here. Here's uh, the old foundations of the uh, fiddling pool that we used to have here. That's the concrete area which they're now using for uh, dumping and storing some of the machinery and everything. As I pointed out before, that's uh, some of the steel frames that will go down inside the uh, steel pylon uh, tubing and then they will pump it over. The outside uh, layers on this now, so you can see how much higher that bridge is going to go. I understand it's 2.7 metres higher than uh, what it normally was. So it's, uh, it's quite a height. From uh, Alexandra Park, it's another different angle. There's um, some more reinforcing uh, beams there. Down here is a um, railing for which they use on the, on the bridge. bring her around to the, uh, the bridge now, our walk bridge. Quite a worn path with uh, people that are walking to and fro over to the... Uh, Down here is the uh, toll box where you've got to pay 50 cents to, to uh, cross the bridge on. You know that during the peak season of uh, the, the Christmas holidays, the New Year, they had this toll bridge closed and there was thousands of, of sightseers and visitors that came across this bridge. 
make it walk on the top batters of the uh, building the new one. And uh, it wasn't there at all, it wasn't being operated. Nine 
1989. First beam goes round to the southern side of the uh, new uh, Royal Bridge. Ship stations, go away.